You're ready. Yes, mm -hmm. go ahead. Good and blessed night to one and all. I am Veronica Ford, member of SAMAP, and I am I have the pleasure to be in front of you moderating this event. We want to apologize for being a little bit late. We had some technical problems, but we're here to enjoy the fourth session of Let's Meet and Up and Talk, a program that is hosted by Mr. Francisco Knight, president of Fundacion Wake Up. Tonight, we have a, a special guest, Bishop Orlean Cummings, philosopher Ricardo Richards, and Pastor Rick, Richard Honeywell, who will be sharing with us about the history of Africa in the Bible. I am sure we all have questions about this topic. As we always do, we will begin our program with a religious invocation by Bishop Estella Knight from St. Mary's Church. Good afternoon. Um, we are gonna now give God the praise and honor the glory as we prepare to begin our show. Let us bow our head in prayer. Turn our Father and friend this afternoon, we come before your mercy seat. Thank you, dear Lord God, for the opportunity that you have given unto us to be able to gather here to speak about the history of the Africans in the Bible. We thank you, Lord God, for those that you made to be a part of this show. We thank you for the panelists that we have. And we know that tonight we are expecting that the show will be a success in Northern Name, but in Jesus' name, use the uh, moderator of the night also that she is able to carry the show through. And whatever we fail to ourselves, we fail not to grant in another name, but in your son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Estela, for that uh, invocation. Um, now, we'll call on President Francisco Knight from Fundacion Wake Up to give us some welcome words. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you all and thank you for accepting uh, my invitation to participate in this, uh, I guess we could call it a forum. I, um, I got this idea from Pastor Richard Honeywell about the possibility of doing something related to Africans in the Bible. I thought it was a very good idea. And I spoke with uh, Bishop Pauline Cummings and my good friend, uh, Ricardo Richard, about the uh, situation. And I spoke with my sister, uh, Mestela, and also uh, Veronica, my backup. And they all agreed that it was a good idea and something interesting to, uh, to take part in. As we know that um, as black folks or African descendants, much of our history is not told and uh, especially in schools and so forth. And we've grown up to believe that uh, the world of uh, good and conquering was all done by our Anglo-Saxons or European people. But with time, and education on our own, we have learned that we as black people played a great, great part in the history of this world in, generation, in, in general for generations. We can go all the way back to times before Christ that uh, black kings and queens made a big difference in what was the history of this world. And, and not only in a religious uh, fashion, but also historically, um, geographically. So, I mean, there's a lot of different contexts that we could uh, mention that we as a, as, a, as a people had to do with in, uh, in society in general. So uh, without 
And the more to say, I welcome uh, my speakers and I will turn it back over to uh, Veronica. Thank you, Mr. Francisco, for that wonderful words of welcoming. And now we'll explain a little bit the, the dynamic of this event tonight. First, we are going to let our three panelists present themselves. Tell us a little bit about who they are and what they do. You will have between three to five minutes. Uh, when you get to three minutes, I'm gonna let, it, if you haven't finished, I'm gonna let you know that you will have two more minutes. And at five minutes, I'm gonna let you know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yep, okay. So that's our first part. The second part of the night, then you are going to explain to us about the history of Africa in the Bible. What do you know? What do you understand? And each one of you will have 10 minutes. Sure, that's just like the opening, the awakening for everybody that is on the Zoom to start like, oh, what is that? and they can start writing their questions on, in the chat. So the, we are gonna to try to do this very interactive. If we see that you say, mention something and, and, uh, and we need you to explain a little bit more, we'll let you know. And then um, Bishop Estela is gonna help us with, with the uh, questions in the Zoom or the comments in the Zoom. And we also, uh, Francisco and I, We'll also be trying to like open up more questions and answers. Okay. So first you're going to present yourself, tell us who you are and what do you do? Three to five minutes, no more. Okay, and we will begin with the lady in the room, Bishop Arlene Cummings. Your your mic is off. You need to turn on your mic. Okay. I apologize for that. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Uh oh. We can hear you. No, um, before I even continue with the introductions, I want to say, you can't hear me? Oh, no, yes. yes. Hello? Yes, continue. Yeah, we can hear you. Your Better? screen froze for a second, but we can hear you now. Uh, froze again. Yeah, she's coming a in and now, so I don't know if it's my internet that's not ready for that ahead of time. Okay. 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 So I'll I'll, re re I'll repeat what I just said. Uh, good night. Uh, I want to first of all thank Francesco of uh, Foundation for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, and as our moderator said, my name is Bishop Orlin Cummings. I am the founder of a not-for-profit uh, organization in Newark, New Jersey. It's called St. Teresa's Ministry and Sabbath School. Um, and what that organization. Internet problems. Yeah, she's so, having some, some technical uh, problems. Um, waters and support work that's been. Orlene, your, your system is freezing. So we're gonna to go to one of the other panelists and then come back to you after. Yeah. But yeah, so um, let's move on to the second panelist, um, Veronica. Philosopher Ricardo Richard, it's your turn. Philosopher, you need to turn on your mic. Ricardo, Richard? you need to open up your mic, Ricardo. There okay. you go. Got it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Greetings to one and all. Having traveled across 40 countries and five continents, I have accepted 
those learning experiences as part of my most important classroom, complemented by higher education and independent research in addition to producing and promoting social cultural events. Add participation in conferences, expressing opinions through mainstream media, and publishing a book. However, the magic key is to be blessed with friends and membership in progressive organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Now we'll go with Pastor Richard Hannawell. Good evening, good evening, good evening, family. It is a joy to be here with you tonight. Of course, I want to thank my brother and friend Francisco for this collaboration we got going on between New York and, and Panama. Very happy with that. And my greetings as well to all of the panelists with who I'll be sharing the night with as well. I'm Pastor Richard Anthony Honeywell Jr., Senior Pastor of City of Freedom Baptist Church, which is located in Brooklyn, New York, Flatbush in particular, uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we've been around now about three years in terms of our ministry, but I'm pretty much a child of the church. Uh, growing up with my grandmother, who was a bishop with a church in Juan Diaz. And uh, then my mom was a pastor as well here in Brooklyn, New York, before she passed away in 2015. So I come from a long line of ministers and priests um, in my family. My being here tonight in particular speaks to work that I've been doing, research that I've been doing and, and workshops that I've been leading for the past since uh, 1995 when I was in seminary here in New York working on my master's degree uh, in biblical studies and that work still continues to this very day. I got to catch up with uh, Re philosopher Ricardo Richards because my book is long overdue bro you seems like you beat me to it so I better get with it mm -hmm. in 2021 and uh, there's probably several books that I need to read write and read as well but I appreciate a point he just made in terms of being able to enjoy the fellowship and collaboration of, of other brothers and sisters, even if they're not in the same uh, religion, same denomination, et cetera, but being able to share what we find and uh, what, what you know the work that we're doing with each other and being able to add that to the body of work on this very important subject that our people, I think, desperately need. Uh, some receive it, and then there are others who fight with it, and that has a lot to do with the depths of colonization that our people have experienced through religion, but are not always aware of the depths of it. So that's what I'll add at this very moment, and just grateful to be here tonight. Thank you very much, Pastor Honeywell, for that brief introduction. Now we go back to Bishop Orlean. Good evening, everyone. Am I a little bit better this time? Yes, Sounds you like are. It. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know what's going on. The internet is really poor. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Bishop Orlean Cummings. Um, I am the founder of a not-for-profit in Newark, New Jersey. And what we do in our organization is basically a lot of philanthropic work where we connect with folks like Francisco Uh, or okay. basic medical supplies. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Go on. It, it keeps cutting out, but go on. It freezes every once in a while. Yeah, it's frozen again. Okay. Um, yeah, Bishop Orlean is having problems, possibly internet connection, maybe weather related, who knows. So um, 
let's go on to um, continue with the program and we'll see if maybe she can switch apparatus and maybe get back in. Okay, sure. Oh, she's coming back. You need your to turn off your mic. Yeah, she's frozen again. Yeah. Wow. Okay. The problem? Continue with the program meanwhile, then even if she comes at the end, that's fine. Yeah, continue okay. with the program. So, so now we are going to start our second uh, part of this pan panel. And we are going to ask uh, philosopher Ricardo Richard to explain a little bit the topic that we are going to deal with today. It, that is history of Africans in the Bible. What do you know? What do you have you find out um, from all these years studying and, and interacting with other people and reading the Bible? Remember, you oh, have 10 uh, minutes. Okay. The first order of business here is to acknowledge that spirituality precedes religion. In order to know where we are going, we ought to at least have a sense of where we are coming from. Our imbalanced supremacist and patrilineal system should be questioned. It has exalted a far-fetched father who art in heaven and downplayed the mother's universal womb. Time should be spent dissecting many sexual connotations beginning with the convention of swearing on a Bible. The words testify, testimonial, and testament are derived from the old Judeo-Christian custom of men swearing by placing their hands on their testicles. Yes, testify, testicle, and testament are all etymologically connected. Research how Jehovah, the now male gendered Godhead, was originally conceived to combine the masculine and feminine principles into a single name. In the same way, we were separated from the ancient principles of Africa's Ma'at, an ancient female goddess and symbol of justice, balance, order, morality, and cosmic harmony. The 42 confessions of Ma'at inspires one to achieve self-improvement through an internal pilgrimage. Since there is nothing outside of a person that is also not found within each human being. Ma'at is the root of the word mother, matter, and mathematics. But our self-centeredness has overshadowed the universal connective tissue. Proclaiming to be God's chosen people is an illusion created from this relative spectrum of dust called planet Earth. The tiny presence of the solar system being part of one of more than two trillion observable galaxies should cause astonishment. We surely are spiritual extensions of the divine spark, receptors and transmitters of cosmic consciousness, energy in perpetual motion, experiencing the material plane. Modern Jews converted to Judaism around 740 AD, but spread throughout Africa are descendants of people some will call them lost tribes, 
who are likely creators of symbols, allegories, and biblical myths. Google, if you may, Lemba in South Africa, Meru in Kenya, Ashanti in Ghana, Falasha in Ethiopia, Igbo in Nigeria, Tutsi, Zulu, Maasai, Fulani. And if one digs deeper, the concept of people of Judah evolved from Abayu, Daya, the Luganda language of Uganda. An in-depth analysis of Dr. Joseph Ben Dokanon's book, Black Man of the Nile and His Black Family, will reveal that the ancient Africans of Egypt had no records whatsoever and left none relating to the biblical stories about Adam and Eve in the garden, the great flood, or the exodus of Israelites from Egypt with Moses. Most of those stories are nothing more or less than the historical glorification of one group of people's histo-mythological experience over another's, most of which they have expanded and blown totally out of perspective and normal rationalization. The custodians of these rearranged Abrahamic tenets have misled the descendants of Africa's originators. We must awaken from an imposed spiritual Alzheimer's by taking heed of Akhenaten's words. The wise man doubts often and changes his mind. The fool is obstinate and doubts not. He knows all things but his own ignorance. So let's continue living, loving, and learning. Simonye, Ashe. Okay. You still have some more time, uh, but as you didn't use it, I, uh, I have a question. You said at the beginning that testimony, testify, and testicles are synonyms, are related. Uh, I'm, I'm still I'm still trying to to understand a little bit more what you meant with that. We are we are talking about the male dominated system that we now exalt, and we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. So okay, what we are alluding to is the word testament had to do with male and all male conception that. Yeah, they put their hands on their testicles and swore. Okay. So in essence, the word is etymologically connected. Testify, testicle, and testament. OK. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. The, my other question is, you, I, 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 th this is what I understood from what you said, that probably God or Jehovah is not a man, but a woman. Oh, Am I right? right? Or, or, or I, do I need to clarify? The, 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 the word Jehovah comes from the tetragrammaton. There were four letters below consonants, Y-H-W-H. -H. The first two letters is, 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 was a male principle. And the other last two were the female principle. So YH evolved into what we know as God, Jod. Okay. And in essence, the evolution and male imposition excluded the female principle. And now uh, Jehovah is known as a male deity. OK. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Do you? Do you still have two minutes? Do you want to share something else? I yield my time until others are willing to uh, at least inquire, make further inquiries. OK, good. Thank you very much for being straight to the point and in time. Now we'll continue with Pastor Hanawell. Same question. Tell us about what you know, what you understand, what you have. Um, learn or investigate about 
our history in the Bible. Give me one second before you go on, um, okay. Pastor. Estella, can you uh, bring uh, Bishop Orlean back in, please? Okay, go ahead, uh, Pastor. Sure. Uh, good evening once again to everyone. Uh, the title in itself, The History of Africa and the Bible, I think is, is a very broad topic. Uh, one that definitely, I think, reflects the breadth of the, the breadth and depth of the African experience in the scriptures and for that matter in the history of Judaism and early and Christianity as well. Uh, I began my research when I was in seminary in 1995. I was at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School, Rochester, New York, 1994 to 97. And it began really with a question for me, a very simple question, where was the Garden of Eden? And, um, but I, I can say that the desire to know more, to understand more had begun way before that. It just happened that I happened to be in seminary at the time and decided I'm here, got access to one of the greatest libraries in uh, American religious academies. Let me make use of it. And from there, my research began in 1995 and continues still to this very day, primarily with a focus on early Christian history in North Africa and the influence of Africa in early Christianity as well. So that I would say this, um, with respect to, in terms of my work, which has involved having to answer in question of the identity of African people in the scriptures, beginning, let's say, with Israel in particular, I think it's important to understand that the word Hebrew first is an Afro-Semitic word, all right? If the word itself is an Afro-Semitic word, then the people themselves are, all, are also an Afro-Semitic people, all right? Which means that the people that we're reading about, whether we believe who they are or not, in our Old Testament, and at least when it comes to the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are an African people as well, all right? That helps to undermine, for one, one of the hardest things to undermine when it comes to both black, white, and Latino person when it comes to scripture. And that is the, Im the dominant images of European people as the people of the book, which they're not. The second point here is this. There at least, when it comes to early Christianity in North Africa, we're talking about at least six different countries where Christianity began to grow for at least 900 years um, and at least 1500 before the misintroduction of Christianity in West Africa through the unholy marriage of religion and slavery. Those countries would be Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, but more so the northern countries themselves of Ethiopia, Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, etc. One of the most famous Christian uh, scholars, theologians, and writers, Augustine of Hippo, is a North African Berber. All right, he's from Tunisia. He's from the city of Hippo in, in Tunisia, which is Northeast Africa. And he's a Berber. He's a brother who happens to also be a Berber. But every image that you will see of Augustine will show you at, at the very least a Southern European, but not a North African Berber, again, because of the, the, the need as uh, our brother pointed out there, the need for a certain type of supremacy, racial supremacy, even when it comes to religion and religious images and the usurping of a people and the misrepresentation of those people when it comes to scripture. So for me, there's a workshop that I've been teaching um, and a series of classes that I've been teaching now since 1995 on the subject matter, pointing out those particular countries, 
in the North Africa, where scripture, um, what where, where scripture and 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 what we now know as Judaism and Christianity gets played out, where it gets formed, um, the personality, biblical personalities that are identifiably so a people of can be identified as a people of African descent in the scriptures that right there in the Bible itself, there are clues that gives you an indication of the identity of those persons, um, both in terms of their ethnicity or their appearance, that they happen to be identified as someone who is a black, someone who is African, someone who is Cushitic, someone who is Ethiopic or Ethiopian, et cetera. That does not mean that everybody else in that everybody else in the scriptures is European. It's actually very interesting that there's a way in which certain the appearance of certain persons will be identified as such as as, as being obvious in that sense. Um, to me, the subject is inexhaustible. To be very honest with you, I'm grateful that uh, our brother philosopher Richards pointed out the works by, by um, Dr. Ben Jokanen, Joseph Jokanen, which to me is, is like mandatory. If you're gonna do the work involved in this work, whether one agrees with all of his conclusions or not, you really can't do the study, the work without also touching on Dr. Ben's works as well. And, um, and, and so for me, it's important for, for particularly black Christians to understand that we have been a part of this process long before we were enslaved, long before Christianity was misused and misinterpreted um, by European Christians in the African slave trade in West Africa, that we were at least a part of this process a whole 1500 years or so before any of that went down. In fact, uh, the Bible, as we know it now, both Old and New Testament, was canonized in Hippo, which is in Tunisia, Northeast Africa, not in Germany, not in Austria, not in France, not in Spain, not in England, then a European country, but right there in the motherland, and that there were some serious um, early Black Christian scholars and theologians who were part of that process of deciding which texts from the Hebrew scriptures and which letters, which gospels, which manuscripts of the early church would be decided upon to be part of the canon um, that we now know as the Bible. So I want to defer at that point so that we can also let our sister have, have um, some time to, to share what she wants to share, unless you have some questions, Veronica, as well. Yeah, I you 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 still have two minutes. So let me let me ask <laughs> you that you mentioned three things that uh, that that trigger my mind. Sure. You, you said you said that when you were studying, um, the first question that came to your mind was where was God of Eden? Did yeah, you where, was the Garden of Eden? where was the Garden of Eden? Right. Yeah, do you got that response? Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, well, for one, it's not like it's it's not as if it's a garden, you know, it's somebody's front yard or backyard. By no means it is is it that. When one examines particularly, let's say Genesis chapter two, where the creation narrative in Genesis chapter two, which gives you very specific landmarks to work with because like Genesis chapter one is pretty much speaking of creation in terms of those seven days. It doesn't really give you landmarks to work with, but in Genesis chapter two, there are very specific identifiable landmarks uh, that one for one to work with. And when you pull up a map, and this is something that doesn't happen often enough in our Bible studies at our churches, we don't marry, let's say geography, with our Bible studies so that we can see when certain places are named and identified, where is this place on a map? So what you have really in a nutshell is an area that begins to cover 
from East Africa where the Nile rivers, both the White and Blue Nile, because they're identified by name there, um, the Pishon River and the Guion River. You know, if you travel to Ethiopia, the Guion is well known because it begins in, it begins to flow from Ethiopia through Sudan and eventually becomes the White Nile in Egypt emptying into the Mediterranean Sea. So you've got a region that kind of covers from East Africa, Egypt, Ethiopia, all the way across, kind of also circling, if you would, up into Mesopotamia, back into North, into North Africa, because the, um, the Tigris and Euphrates, which are also named and identified during Genesis chapter two, are found in what's now modern day Iran and Iraq. Okay. Great. And there are explanations for that as well. But so we're not talking about a single spot, so to speak, as we would identify or think of a garden. Okay. Now, what's key with what's if you don't mind, what's key about that is the ways in which European maps or American European Euro Eurocentric maps have a tendency to put the word Kush many a times outside of Africa. They would only put Kush in the Middle East. But the word Kush is a Hebrew word that means the land of blacks. And more yeah. updated maps will also have Kush, of course, identifiably so in East Africa, where it's all where it should be um, as well. And that's very important because depending on which biblical translation you're using, they're either using the word Kush or the word Ethiopic or Ethiopian interchangeably between the two. Okay, thank you very, very much. I have other questions, but but our time here finished we're going to go with bishop orlean and then we'll go back and forth with questions and answers all yours bishop turn on your mic how are you we're trying this for the third um, <laughs> yeah now, remember take, take at least two minutes take at least two minutes to share with us who you are, what you do, because we, we couldn't understand that before. So, and then you will have your 10 minutes to explain about that history. Okay. Hello everyone. Once again, I do apologize. I don't know what's going on with uh, internet, but anyway, again, uh, my name is Bishop Orlean Cummings. I am the founder of a not-for-profit organization in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and what our focus in our organization is basically to do a lot of philanthropic work in areas of color. Um, and what does that look like? We partner up with organizations who are doing the work in, in foreign lands. For example, like how we met my brother Francisco and he's doing this great work in Panama with mothers who need pampers. So what we do is partner up with him and ship uh, what he needs so he can do his work. So we, we have our footprint in Panama, we've done some work in Haiti, um, and we're just really traveling around to see where we can help as much as possible, but that help is focused on communities of color, uh, especially pro uh, communities that are really significantly underserved. So that's what I do in a nutshell. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Good job. Now, you tell us a little bit of what you have studied, what you have investigated, what you have learned through the, 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 the passing of the years about the history of African in the Bible. Okay, um, that's such an interesting uh, journey for me. One, because uh, I'm not American by birth, as you probably can hear from my accent. I was born in Georgetown, Guyana, um, and my mother was a mystic. So my mother made certain that as a very young person, I was very, I was exposed to a vast library of material that I wasn't just supposed to read scripture and sacred text, but mom made certain that I was exposed to a great deal of supplemental material so that I understand the history behind the writers and the thinking behind what created scripture or sacred text. Um, but as an adult, I, I have a master's in divinity from Drew University. And while at that school, I really started to hone um, most of my questions in terms of where do I see people of color in scripture? Um, and I just didn't limit 
my thinking in terms of Christian texts, but I looked at a variety of different types of sacred texts to see how people of color and women are represented in those texts. And what is the overlying message that is being sent out by either consciously or unconsciously about people of color and where they fit into the world. So that's some of what my investigation has been about. So first, you still have eight minutes. Okay. So you, you, you want to say something else or you want me to start questions? Go ahead the questions because <laughs> I feel like I need to catch up to the other panelists. <laughs> okay. Um, you just mentioned that you have a master in divinity. What mm. is that? How do you eat that? <laughs> That is a fancy degree <laughs> that costs a lot of money. Um, but bottom line, I went to, I attended seminary um, and the seminary that I did attend was Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. Um, and this university actually is, uh, is a Methodist seminary. But what they did was make certain that as seminarians, as pastors, that we were exposed to the history behind the text. We, there was a great emphasis in terms of understanding how do communities of color, how does oppression impact how we as people of color read sacred text and how do we find ourselves in there? Um, for example, if we start to do a conversation about how do you define God? What does that conversation look like if you ask someone of color or you ask someone of European descent? And how do you find a way to stand at that intersection so that when you stand to preach at a community, you know how to reach them? So it's a fancy degree that said we did a lot of research in terms of understanding the biblical text, the historical Jesus, and all the various characters that have that are in the canon and outside of the canon. So a lot of research done for about five years to get the work done. Okay, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know we we had master degree in divinity. Yeah, but that 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 sounds great. That sounds oh, like boom. <laughs> a lot of information. Yeah. So in that same line, um, I want you to let us know if, if, if you had to preach tonight and your audience was totally white, how would you focus if somebody um, have the question of God is black. Okay. That's not a question I would run from at all. And as a matter of fact, what I would try to help them to understand is that the word God in and of itself is a term. It doesn't define a, a, a character. And what has happened over history and over time, if you study a lot of the, the way God has been personified and I guess in a way couched down to make God appear to be human, what some communities have done was put a color on that, on what God looks like. They put a face on what God looks like and they put a race on what God looks like. And that is all for the purpose of colonization. Because if you want a particular group of people to see themselves as superior, then yes, you're gonna make everything define, everything that's divine, everything that's in leadership, everything that's supposed to be right or wrong, look like the people who should be in leadership. So my, the way I broach that subject in a preaching text would be to one, I'm gonna demystify that. I'm gonna break that apart and tell them, listen, we need to understand God as that spirit and that divine intelligence that has brought about all of us. And, all, and we all represent what God looks like. So you can't decide that God is white or black. God has no face, God has no race, and God has no gender. Because of, in order for you to then narrow God to a race or gender or class to me, is insulting to what the being of what God truly is. Because God is too big to be narrowed down in those, uh, those very insulting terms. And I feel like what has happened over time so that people can make God relatable, they've made God very human-like which sounds like, like Greek mythology. So we, uh, we've given God a personality, we've given God temperament, we've given God arms and legs, we've given God a voice, we've also even given God prejudices. So these are things that we need to really understand where did that come from and why do we feel the need to add those things to God in order to make God relatable and to make it seem as if we can control that God because we know what God thinks, right? If we can say, well, God looks like me, then God must think like me. So I would want to, I 
I would really want to push back against the need to make, um, to define what God looks like in very human terms. Okay. That means that we need to focus on divinity, Correct. not human. Correct. Okay. Good. Great. We are in time. We, we are in the margin of time. Okay. Good. So, <laughs> so, so don't worry. Um, we still have two more minutes. So okay. if you want to share something else before we go back and forth, you are okay. in your time. Okay. And the other part of that conversation where we're talking about how do we approach God, especially me as a person of color preaching to a white audience, which for some reason I've had the chance to do that. I would want to talk about why was it necessary to give God a color and how does that yeah. translate into the psyche of people who don't look like that God? How does that translate and how they ought to behave? How do they see themselves? When you start talking about God, then you start creating these um, dichotomies of right and wrong. And we want to decide, well, what's good and what's what's holy and, and who falls into each category. So that's something I really want to be very cautious with people of faith, especially if your focus is growth. You want to really be mindful of the messages that you're sending through your sermons. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, the, reason, the reason why I ask is because um, normally white is good, black is bad. Exactly. You know, when, when you show God, he has a white face. When you show the devil, he has a black face. And then that's why I think our generation, our black folks don't want to relate with anything that means black, that relates with black. Correct. And, and although the Bible talks about all, all the Ethiopians and the good work that they did and whatever, um, um, suffering, but they at the end came out victorious. We see that we still, as Pastor Honeywell said, we are still undermined. Correct. Until today. But I think there's a re that's in, there's an intentionality behind that kind of uh, language because if you want to colonize a group of people, the first thing you have to do is break down their understanding of themselves. You must break down anything that they hold to be sacred. You must break down and destroy anything that would ground those people so that they can fight back. So the first thing you do is attack identity. So if we start to attack identity by then deciding, well because you don't look this way, then you can't be good. Because you don't look and behave this way, then you cannot be holy. That's a way to start to push against that person's sense of self. And then when you start to do that as an individual, then you start to do that in a communal level where you now you have an entire community now seeing themselves as not good people because of a thing that they have no control over, which is the color of their skin. The, the, the sad part and the damaging part of that is when you start to cause adults to start to believe that they're no good or they're bad because of the way they look, then that passes down to their children. Now you start talking about generational destruction that starts to happen because what you've done, you've colonized their minds. You've made them stop seeing themselves as beautiful because they were created that way to now seeing themselves as a mistake or an accident of creation or something that God sort of made a mistake about. So they need to spend time fixing that mistake. So I do believe that there's an intentionality behind the rhetoric about what God looks like. Somebody wanted to maintain control. They needed to uh, maintain the great divide between groups of people for the purpose of oppression and subjugating the other so that those lower people on those lower stands can now serve those who are above. So I do believe there's an intentionality to that. This, this is not by accident. Yeah. If I can intervene for a minute. Sure, sure. Um, we have a, a question from Glenroy James. He uh, put his question in Spanish, but I'm going to uh, translate it. Uh, biblically speaking, how can we sustain 
that Jesus is black. And I would um, ask um, Ricardo Richards and um, first, and then Pastor Honeywell to comment on that. We'll start with um, Ricardo Richards. Ricardo, you need, uh -huh. okay. Uh, the, the concept of uh, Christ and Christianity, uh, KRS, uh, KRS, the anointed, has evolved from thousands of years before the Christian era, uh, whereby there was the trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru. Uh, Heru. Then that was the original uh, 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 trinity. Heru would be the Christ uh, uh, toward uh, being uh, the, the, the trinity, the, tri the child that is born that we see uh, in the, uh, the chronology of our Christianity. So uh, everything that we have uh, learned has had its root in ancient Africa. And um, today we have uh, the old concept of, uh, of uh, Christ being crucified while it was Osiris, even though we uh, originally was called Os Asar. Osiris uh, being uh, one who was uh, uh, cut up in pieces by Set. Set is also an allusion in the Bible, and dispersed throughout the desert, a type of a uh, of a uh, 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 Abel and uh, uh, the, the whole concept of Christianity is rooted from the earlier times that we are seeing. In in for example, many people are not connected to the emerald tablets of Ehudi. Uh, writings that go back some 36,000 years. It is the oldest known writing in human history. And uh, Tehudi is known today as taught. The word taught emanates from Tehudi or Hermes. So all of these uh, concepts emanate from earlier traditions that were, uh, I guess, uh, plagiarized modified and incorporated into what we know in the Bible today as uh, Christianity or Jesus and uh, things of that nature. Any, you, we need something to be added to that? No, we'll um, um, take um, Pastor uh, Honeywell. Honeywell now. All right. Uh, the question was, how do we sustain Jesus being black? Um, what I did earlier was made a couple of points. First, we can't separate and should not separate Jesus's identity from the people to which he belonged to. He was born through a woman that was of a particular ethnicity. Mary was an Israelite, right? Jesus himself, when we read the New Testament, when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is also an Israelite. When we speak in terms of ethnicity and culture, he followed the, the Torah, observed the Torah, etc. And so let me do it this way. If Hebrew as a language and the identity of a people, because there are many people around the world and in African societies in particular, whose names are actually the name of their language. So the Hebrew people are known by their language. Hebrew in itself, if you just look up any basic dictionary, like a Webster's dictionary, you're gonna find that it is identified as an Afro-Semitic language, meaning what? It is a language of an African Semitic people. What does that mean in modern day language? There are black people. 
I mean, that's, that's the simplest way of breaking it down. There are black people. They just happen to be an Afro-Semitic people. So if Jesus is an Israelite of the Hebrew community that they all were a part of, then, and if, and if there's these people and their language is an Afro-Semitic language, then what does that make Jesus ethnically or culturally? It means that he's also a black man as well, as the rest of his tribe was as well, as his mother was, as his, <laughs> as his earthly grandmother would have been, as Joseph would have been, et cetera, right? Um, so in that sense, what, but what happens here when we kind of find these creative ways of, of, of proving some of our points is that we're constantly fighting against the power of images in our minds. We don't realize just how deeply embedded those white European images are in our consciousness that even when we find creative and supportive ways of explaining and showing what the, what the um, identity of these people would have been, we still struggle with it. It's not that we're struggling with the info, we're struggling with the information being given because we're actually struggling with the images that are deeply embedded in our minds. That's, that's really where the, bat, the main fight really is at, is, is we can't get past seeing Jesus in some, as black, seeing Mary as black, seeing Joseph as black, seeing Paul, Peter, Matthew, right? All of his disciples, imagining in that, because why? Because from the time you were little children, growing up in our churches with those uh, Sunday school books and the images on our walls, because our people didn't have access to anything that was more authentic it is not that easy to just erase those images and replace them with the realization that those people look like us. They look just like us. And that takes a while to undo. You know, it takes a while to undo. So Jesus, because of the, the, the ethnic group into which he was born into, the woman to which he was born to. And that's very important, right? That we're having this, this particular conversation and this particular point. Here we are in Advent. Christmas is right around the corner. We're about to celebrate the birth of Christ, right? And so what are we talking about? Really, to me, we're talking about a black woman who gave birth to the Messiah. Well, she can't be black and he be white. Am I making any sense here? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I want to yeah. say something. Just give me a second here. I want to say something in support of, you know, I'm, I'm listening to Bishop Cummings with, um, with her, her excellent points that she made. I don't think that the work of the conscious Black biblical scholar and theologian, the work that we consciously take on to correct centuries of mis-teachings, misappropriations, the colonizing of the scriptures uh, by our, you know, want to be nice about it, our white counterparts. I don't think that folks fully understand you know, the work that we have to do to correct what they have messed up while still trying to be true to the theology and spirituality of the faith. Correct. Let me give you, let me, let me make a point here because I'm not contradicting my sister. I just want to add something here because I understand the struggle she just went through explaining what she, what, what she was explaining to you. And sometimes that, 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 I don't want to call it a dance, that a, a certain walk that we engage in sometimes that can be a bit tricky for us on occasion. There's a thing called incarnation, right? When we talk about mm -hmm. the birth of Jesus, for us Protestants on December 25th, when we talk about his birth, we're really talking in theological Christian terms, the incarnation of God through Jesus Christ. 
Right. We're not just talking about the birth of a baby. If God is the one who impregnated Mary to give to, to give birth to this Messiah, then what we're talking about is the incarnation of God through Jesus, right? Well, here's a challenge that we that we've had to face in terms of countering the power, the psychological power of white images. If Mary is an Afro-Semitic woman, then we have to accept that Jesus would at least look like Mary in terms of his biological, ethnic appearance and look, right? So, I mean, we all have an appearance. It's not as if any of us is androgynous. So if Mary is Black, and let's suppose that we say boldly, if Mary is Black and she gave birth to a Black child who happens to be the Messiah, who happens to be the incarnation of God, then we can safely say then by default that at least when it comes to Jesus being the incarnation of God, God is Black. See what I'm saying? <laughs> y'all y'all follow my logic? You follow, Bishop, you following my logic? <laughs> however, however, here, here's what I know that my sister did. So we can come to that conclusion, biologically speaking. However, what one still has to hold on to is what does that really mean? So we can assert not wanting to be racist or counter racist, but simply a matter of biology of what most likely he would have looked like, at least in terms of complexion and color, et cetera, based on who he was born into or born through. However, that really should be the limitation of that because mm -hmm. he was beyond that. Correct. Correct. He was beyond that. It was not a race issue. Europeans made it a race issue. We didn't make this a race issue. What we're trying to do is fix it and correct it. So even the acknowledgement of that has great value for Black folks to hear. It, and, and at the same time, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for whites to hear it. It's a challenge for white Latinos to hear it. It's a challenge for some Blacks to hear it because everybody's got to deal with those images in their heads. And what does this mean? Because we know for sure that European descendants, whether in Europe, the United States, or Latin America, base a lot of their self-identity and self-worth on everything looking like them. Correct. So now if you find ways, not, not ways that are be, that are um, that don't have any 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 back into it, but using the tools to make your case as to who these people were and what they looked like. What you're doing is really challenging and undermining, as, as Bishop said, pushing back on a big piece of how these folks see themselves and their power in the world. Correct. The thought that your Messiah was a Black man. Well, how have you treated Black men? Correct. How have you treated Black women? That the Messiah's mother's a Black woman. Well, how have you treated Black women for the past 500 years? And the thought mm -hmm. that the Mary you worship, the Mary you stand prayers up to, the Mary you bow to, the Mary you do novenas to, the Mary you, you, you do all that stuff to is a Black woman. Mm -hmm. Now what happens to you psychologically? Correct. See, I understood what the bishop was doing there. I just, yeah. wanted, to, I just wanted to throw that little tidbit in there. That's all. I'm good. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you know, it's, it's good to have this type of interaction because it makes people, it, it makes people aware of what we are living today is no different from what our foreparents lived. Because yes. if, if, we are, if we do the relationship between what happened before and what we are passing through now is similar. The only thing that 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 situation changed a little bit, or the words that they use changed a little bit. But right. at the end, right. it's the same thing. The same thing. You see TVs. How many blacks do you see on TV? Because right. for them, this is the the profile. And he has to have straight hair, clear skin, no dark skin. And if you have 
uh, normal, natural hair, or it, that that's not that's not good for the image of the TV, or for the mm -hmm. image of a bank, or for the image of whatever they feel to say. Same thing. I got a um, I got a uh, oh, uh -huh. a question or maybe a comment. In, okay. um, before you go to your before you go to the question or comment, let's listen to Bishop Orlean and then we go with the, your question and comment. Um, if for in terms of the question that came in, how do you ground the question of if Jesus was black? Like how do you prove it in scripture? What I would tell the person who asked that question is to look in the book of Revelation. If you look at Revelations chapter one from about verse 14 to 15, you see a description of Jesus. Uh, and what it talks about is his hair texture and it talks about his skin tone. And those are some of the arguments that I've had to use whenever people push back with what I'm asking them to do, which is to, to for a moment, step out of this dichotomy that everything holy is white and stop for a moment and look and see the clues that are actually embedded in scripture and show you that exactly that the color of the Messiah or the, the historical Jesus, it's, there's no way it can match the European version of what Jesus looks like. Um, and, and again, like I said, in the book of Revelation, it tells you that his hair was like wool. His skin had a bronzish tint to it. Um, but the thing that is also, if you were to even take that conversation and build it up a little bit more, when the Europeans came into Africa, the first thing they destroyed were the images of the African gods or deities. Because why? All of those deities were black. They represent the strength of the black community, the beauty of the black community, the resilience of the black community, the, of, of the black community's ability to be kings and queens and to really, I would say, be self-sustaining. So those were some of the things that the, um, the missionaries attacked by telling the um, native community, listen, those things are not of God. Those are demons. Destroy them. Stop believing in them. Don't venerate those things. So that's some of the conversation that I would actually speak to the, to the person who's questioning, how do you prove, I guess, is what they're asking. How do you prove that Jesus was black? Look in the book of Revelations, but also again, historically, if you look at some of the clues that are contained, even in the book of um Genesis, if you're looking at the creation narrative where uh, Adam, which is not a name, it's actually a title describing the color of Adam and he's not white, he's actually reddish because it describes the dirt from which he was created. So I'll, I'll couch that conversation and come back to that a little later. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you Bishop Orlean. That was very good information there. Um, I just wanna make a comment before we continue. The question that I asked earlier came in Spanish and I translated it into English because our program is English. And then someone made a comment that if the question was in Spanish, it should be read in Spanish. But I think that they're um, forgetting or not realizing that our program is an English program because we're dealing with people in Panama and also people in the United States, some who don't speak Spanish. So it's an English related program. But I want to, um, I watched a documentary um, a little while back. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they had talked about in, in, in conjunction with what you just mentioned, Bishop Orlean, about the destructions of our monuments and so forth. One of the things that they mentioned was that I, I think it's in Russia that there's a museum that has all the the paintings and artifacts from mm. times be, before Jesus. Wow. And that um, these, these um, paintings and so forth were ordered to be transformed into white images by f some famous uh, painters. And one of those uh, they spoke about was the image of Jesus. And in the, the, the transformation of the image of Jesus, they said that um, the image of Jesus was done based on the image of the third Pope mm. at that time, which I think his name was 
Anacletus or Anacletus or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. So I would like all three of you to uh, make comments on that, of your knowledge of that. And we'll start with um, uh, Ricardo Richards. Thank you. I have heard uh, we are very, uh, I guess, spiritual people in search of uh, objective truth. And one of those uh, riddles, I will have to ask a question. If the concept of Jesus came from Elus, or Elus, which was an allegory or myth that evolved to become Mary and Jesus. In other words, from Isis and Olus, they are monuments uh, that go back at least three to 4,000 years of Isis and Olus. There, is no, there was no Mary and Jesus at the time. Now, my, I, there's uncertainty. Uh, I cannot confirm or uh, verify the existence of something or one who was once allegory and myth that became some degree of historicity. So I am perplexed. I am not accepting or denying the possibility. I, all I'm aware of is that allegory and those histories came from us. The only perplexing question is, have we gone from the allegories and myth to confirming or accepting what the Westerners did create the degree of historicity? That's my question. So I have other things to say, but uh, in terms of Mr. Honeywell, in regards to the Kushite, but I'll leave that after. Uh, uh, Bishop Cummings, uh, in terms of the, the, the uh, concept of uh, Adam, uh, there was the esoteric, esoteric Atum from ancient Egypt, Atum, A-T-U-M, evolved into physics, Atom. Mm -hmm. And today, the exoteric Adam. So these are things that probably we need to uh, research further into our ancient past and, and to determine whether what the Westerners have done uh, deserve validation and confirmation as history. So I yield for others to take up that slack. Okay. You can go ahead, Bishop. Uh... I mean, um, Pastor uh, Honeywell, you can go ahead. Huh. Um, so the original question was one thing. The answer, the challenge posed by a brother to me was something different. Um, first, I am not aware of who that third pope may have been in, ter in terms of, not that I might not be aware who the third pope may have been, I'm not aware of the use of the image of the third pope of the church um, as one of the representations of Jesus in early art, early Christian art. I, I won't say yes, I can't say no to that. I'm really not aware of that. That is not something that I have spent time researching, et cetera. So I couldn't, I can't respond to that um, at this specific moment to that specific question. That'd be somebody else would have to answer that one for me. What I would say um, to our brother, to philosopher Richard's points that he has been making all night, which I am more than aware of, more than aware of. It's not my first time hearing any of those points uh, tonight. And, and I, what I was, I would say a couple of things. One, if there's one very solid thing that I hope will come out of this, 
is our need to broaden our studies for one, right? Mm. Um, I believe that, you know, whether one accepts whether the Israelite people lived or not, whether they were real or not, I get that. But at least within the book of Exodus, what you have is a point being made that these people were there some 430 years from the time they entered to the time that they left. Not that they were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years as some people would allude to, or I think I've misused that text, but that they were present there for that number of time, for that, for that spread, um, length of time. My point to that is this, it's kind of impossible to be in a place for 430 years unless you're living in a cave for all that time and not be influenced by the dominant culture of that right. place. Right. So you can't leave Egypt after 10 years, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, less more 400 years, and not leave with something, some ways of thinking of those people with you. Right. I say that to say that one thing that I've, I've come to realize that we have not done because Egypt is very prominent at the very beginning of, of the Old Testament and, and, and very prominent place in Old Testament is that we haven't given Egypt when it comes to Christians, uh, whether it's white or black, we haven't given Egypt its due in the sense of seeing Egypt as more than just this very limited um, view of Egypt as this dominant oppressive culture of people. That's really the dominant view of Egypt in Christian thought and even Judaic thought for that matter. This one limited experience with a people whose histories go back thousands of years. And to me, I just think that as particularly as black Christians, if we are to, if we can just consider adding African history studies to our curriculums, Egypt deserves a far better place in terms of the study of Egypt when it comes to our Old Testament studies as well. I'll leave it at that. Uh, go ahead. Uh... Bishop Cummings. Okay, in response to the original question about where does this image of Jesus come from? Actually, it was developed over time. Jesus is in the earliest recorded images of what Jesus looks like. It was actually recorded in a document called the Rabula Gospel. Now, that's a Byzantine gospel that was compiled in Asia, and this is going back to the sixth century. And what has happened? Hollywood then stepped in and then started modifying what Jesus looked like, how he sounded. And if you also look at images of what Jesus looked like on the cross, even those images have been modified over time, thanks to Hollywood and white folks then, of course, again, superimposing their imagery of what they thought he looks like onto us. So in, to answer the question of where does the image of Jesus come from, it's it honestly developed over time. So now we have particular actors, Charleston Heston, and these actors who then started playing the role of Jesus. And because of how they looked, it sort of seeped its way into our consciousness and our understanding of what Jesus looks like. So it's an image that was created it, and it, not necessarily based on history. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a comment from, uh, well, there's no name, just a phone code. This is a great conversation. It should happen regularly. Thank you all for your great insights and passion. I have to go to work now, but I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, um, blessed for the opportunity to have joined you all for the time. I was able to for the time I was able to. Blessings uh, to all. And then uh, what was the African religion before European influence? Uh, 
we'll give that um we'll give that one to um Pastor Honeywell. <laughs> what was what was the that's a definite article <laughs> right there, right? The right. there is there, there wasn't a the African exactly. religion, it was a exactly. singular African exactly. religion in Africa before European influence. Correct. Africa is not a state, Africa is not a country, Africa is Correct. a continent. A continent. With exactly. thousands of people, thousands of ethnic groups, um, all of which had their mm -hmm. own cosmologies, their own spiritual exactly. systems, etc. What we what we have, uh, and the, again, depending on on what circles you're in, and I, and I appreciate the I appreciate what Brother Richards is is sharing here with us, what he's driving home. I get it, bro. I get it. Um, what has happened over time is that a great deal of work because of the prominence of Kemetic culture and religion for thousands of years and how much documentation there is of that, that one can find still to this very day, if you go to Egypt and just visit those pyramids and the temples, et cetera, and the, and the, the, the incredible uh, documentation that is still there after thousands of years. If you go there with someone who knows what they're talking about, what has happened is that religion is uh, Egyptian culture and history and religion, ancient, if you would, if you don't mind me saying so, um, has really stayed and become prominent in all of our consciousness and minds. But you got the Yorubas with their systems of Ifa in Nigeria. You got your folks in Benin with Vodun, which you find in uh, very prominent in, um, in Haiti to this day, uh, and, and others. So there isn't a religion, one singular religion, that was the African religion, a religion of Africans in Africa prior to Europeans. There were many thousands Correct. that some would still exist to this very day, right. in spite right. of the fact that you may have had the Spaniards and the French and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the British, you know, colonized Africa for so many years. And because the church may have become by virtue of this process, um, such a prominent presence does not mean that those traditional African spiritualities and spiritual systems and cosmologies have disappeared. Correct. So my Correct. travel to Africa, Ghana in particular, it's well known that you know there are Ghanaian Christians that when something ain't quite working for them, they go looking for a priest. Yes. You go to Cuba and you have a Catholic church in Cuba with Cubans going there and right across the street in the park, you got Santeria, you got Santero priests right across Correct. the park. And Correct. you got these saints that when they're in there praying to their saint and they'll come out and go right across the street to get a Correct. reading. Correct. Correct. So it's not black and white, as we would like to think that it is in some places. But Correct. the answer to, at least my answer is there wasn't a dominant religion in Africa. There are still thousands that are still exist to this very day. Correct. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Ricardo Richards, was the concept of Jesus force on Africans as a mean to subdue? And that's by K. Rowe. A question. Uh, repeat the question again. Was the concept of Jesus forced on Africans as a means to subdue? Yeah, the new uh, version rehashed was used to subdue uh, the uh, captured and enslaved. And I will bet that uh, we are still ensnared by those, uh, I guess, chains, mental chains. And I, it's not an easy task to convince many to doubt. I don't forget that I, I use Akhenaten, an ancient African, uh, that said to doubt is, you know, it, it bodes well for being who we are. And uh, I, I like what 
Bishop Cummings said earlier about spirit. And I began by saying spirituality precedes religion. And if you notice the word spirit and spiral, spiral and spirit are co-evil. It suggests that we are bound as one within the universe, genderless in the spiritual realm, spiraling into the material world. Humans get jump-started primarily as females until the defining sixth week when testosterone kicks in for males. The spiral is the most profound design in the universe built into physical manifestation and life forms. From seashells to man, blood spirals through your veins, plants spiral up from the soil, fingertips spiral as does ocean waves and winds. From the mega spiral swirl of galaxies to the micro spiral strand of DNA in perpetual motion within the universal spirit of the absolute cause. So that, in essence, suggests that people are talking about the sun, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And others will suggest, uh, counter by saying the sun is the light of our uh, solar system. So we have yet to suggest or uh, accept that spirituality precedes mm -hmm. religion, and religion is a construct. A lot of things were constructed to accommodate our perception of phenomena. And even in Egypt, for one to be versed or knowledgeable, we had to study 40 years. The mysteries that today we take for granted and try to dissect. So we have a lot still to unravel. Like I said, we must continue living, loving, and learning. Okay. Um, do you have a question, Veronica, for the panel? No, I, I, I really um, wanted to, to just say that um, it has been a wonderful experience uh, talking about the history of African in the Bible. And something that I, that I think that we can close up with is just reflecting on when we read the Bible, how do we um, um, reflect on the inner message that the words have? Why? Because long time ago, I read I read an article about how the Bible that we use nowadays has been um, updated so many times and they have eliminated a lot of information about us, about Africans, about the, the real history. Of. So we usually read the Bible and we just like go through it. But I, 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 am, I know and I understand that every word has an, an interpretation. Uh, every verse has an interpretation. How can we understand that interpretation? And how, as, as Bishop Orlean mentioned that if we read uh, Revelation chapter one, we will, understand that, that there are a specific characteristic that can lead us to understand that Jesus or God was a dark skin. So for the three of the panelists, how, how, 
how would you tell people that they need to, to read the Bible and understand the Bible and understand the background message that the Bible has? I don't know if I, if I explain my, my, my point. Pastor Hannibal, I think you, yeah. you raised your hand. Okay. Yeah, I did. I did. I raised my hand there. Um, I can I can fully understand the perplexities of what's happening. Um, and again, you know, when we consider what has happened, especially over the last 500 years of Christian history, Western history, etc., you know. There's, there's no question that there are going to be some doubts. There's going to be some question. There's going to be some mistrust of scripture, et cetera. And I would say um, to some, and, and the ways in which that gets perpetuated. I don't think that we can honestly answer that question in five minutes, to be very honest with you, Veronica. It's really not that simple. What I, what I and I believe, I think I can safely say, Bishop Cummings, um, as, as Christians in particular, in this particular conversation, are, are alluding to, there's a word called hermeneutics. H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-C-T-I-C-S, yeah. -E 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 hermeneutics. And what hermeneutics means is that you bring a particular lens, a particular critical lens to the reading of scripture either as a black man, a black woman, et cetera. We bring a particular lens to the reading of the scripture. Everybody has a hermeneutical angle or hermeneutical mm -hmm. lens. If there's one thing that I would like to, I hope to contribute to this conversation as a Christian pastor is for us to understand that we do have a hermeneutical lens as a black people. The problem is we oftentimes don't trust our hermeneutical lens because we're either giving Europeans too much credit or we don't realize the ways in which they've impacted our thinking, even about scripture. And if we're not engaged in a conversation in terms of quote unquote, our Bible studies, et cetera, where this is constantly reinforced over and over again, then we may not realize that we do bring a hermeneutical lens to the scriptures as a people that is really very valid. I've heard over and over again from folks, stuff's been taken out of the scriptures about black people, et cetera, et cetera, but yet nobody can show me or prove to me what was taken out, when was it taken out, by whom was it taken out? So in other words, we have a lot of hearsay born out of a mistrust a mistrust of what Europeans must have done with the Bible to hide certain things from us. My point is this, I don't know all of what that may be, but what I do know from my study, my research and the work I've done, we're in the book. I don't know what's missing, but I know what's there. I know how Africa is present. I know how Africans are present. I've learned how to identify them as well to show you where they are, how they are, and how they're identified in the scriptures. Um, if anything, the hard part is actually finding the Europeans. <laughs> no, it, it may sound like a joke, but that's true. The hard part is really finding the Europeans because none of this is happening in Europe. None of this is happening yeah. in Europe. Your main European presence, let's say like in the New Testament, are the Romans. Pontius Pilate, the Romans who are there, the Roman centurion, the Roman soldier, we don't even talk about why they're there. But it's not as if you have an overwhelming European presence in the scriptures. It's really all about us. But it's taking the time to methodically show that to us so that we can see that we are here. I don't know what's missing, what's been taken out. Like I said, I ain't seen nobody show me what those things happen to be, but I do know how we're there. Which says what? It says to me something I've come to realize. And by the way, we're not the only two persons doing this work. There's a long history of, of Black biblical scholars who've been doing that work. Cummings and I are really standing on shoulders of people who've of come course. before us 
Of course. Including the brothers and sisters like Brother Richards and the work that they do critiquing scripture, et cetera, which I'm not, I'm not throwing that out at all. I appreciate that because what it's forced me to do is to dig deeper. Correct. It's to dig deeper without dismissing it. Correct. But what it says to me, Veronica, and for the folks who are listening, Black church needs to have or rethink how we do Christian education in the Black church. We need to rethink that. We're, we're unconsciously using a white model. We need to rethink that. And we need to recognize we can bring our history into this. We can include our history into this. We can bring an African-centered hermeneutics, which would not be contradictory because the book is already an African-centered book. Okay. But it's showing folks how to do that. And part of my hope, uh, I got to catch up with, with, with Richards because I got to write a book or two. <laughs> and one of those has to <laughs> you gotta talk, brother. And one of those has to be designing a curriculum for black churches on how to go about this because we don't have a model to work with. Most of us don't have a model to work with. And so that's part of my hope uh in doing that as well, somewhere down the road. Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. And um in, in agreeing with uh, Veronica a little bit, you know, we've had different Bibles over the years. You know, like um, I was talking with uh, Orlean, Bishop Orlean recently, and I was talking about some personal stuff. But when I was involved with the Lodge, uh, one of the important uh, verses in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And in the old Bible, it says, and now by that faith, hope, charity. These three, but the um, theorist of all is charity. And you look in the new Bibles and it says love. And I look at it that if you have love, yeah. faith, hope, charity comes along. So why did they remove charity in these newer Bibles to put the word love? You know what I'm saying? So there are changes, and we know that um, uh, the King James Bible was a translation of the Catholic uh, Bible in separation. And we know that um, the, the, the wording of the Bible was done based on that time for ruling and dominance of people, regardless of color of skin. So um, those things do have to be taken into consideration and talked about. Uh, we know that the Bible was officially written by men and some parts of the Bible was written hundreds of years after the actual history of what happened. You know, so all of that has to be sort of taken into consideration. And um, I would, because um, I think we've been on for a little bit over an hour and a half or close to two hours. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have, but I think we've covered a lot of um, great issues, and I think people that were on enjoy uh, what we did. We'll just have to kind of decide about maybe doing another um, similar type program. So what I would like to do at this time is to have uh, some closing comments and I would like to start with Bishop Orlean Cummings. Okay. Uh, this was quite a conversation. Um, I do agree that it's something that needs a part two, three, and four, um, because there's some <laughs> really you. critical you. issues. You, you guys brought up some big topics, and I don't think any of us as panelists really feel that we've done justice to any of the subjects, because each of the questions you've raised, they're a conversation by themselves and they're a thesis by themselves. Um, but there's a great book that I studied while I was in uh, seminary. It's called God of the Oppressed. It's a book by James Cone. And he's a Black uh, theologian. And the way he describes how we as people of color ought to approach uh, scripture is to never forget our Blackness. Don't forget that you come from a different platform than the folks who wrote this. How, how many 
centuries ago. And what he advises us to do is when you read, don't gloss over the material. Look at it. Carefully read it. Don't just read it as a person of faith, but sometimes try to take off those lens of faith and look at the words that are actually in front of you. And it speaks volumes. Um, and for example, if you take a book like the book of Acts, in the book of Acts chapter eight, you have the story of Philip who meets an Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch is in charge of what's called a kadake. And that kadake, excuse me, is treasury. So you have so many stories embedded in sacred texts that show you that people of color were not dumb. We were not slaves. We were not just slaves, but many of us and a lot of cultures of people of color were very, very powerful in ancient, um, in ancient times. But again, I really, really, I'm excited about this conversation. I really think it needs a lot more time, a lot more fleshing out. Um, and it was a pleasure meeting the fellow panelists. I hope that we meet again and we, we have more conversations. And again, thank you, Francesco, for inviting me to be a part of this. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we'll continue with um, Pastor Honeywell. Uh, well, listen, man, if there's an invitation that I will never turn down is this one, mm. especially on this subject, because I've been on this now since at least, well, consciously, 1995, but I think far earlier than that, because for me, when I began to study the scriptures and examine the scriptures and began to read it through the lens of African cultures, I began to see a lot of what I will refer to as Africanisms that we as a people still practice to this very day. I was able to see some stuff that my grandmother and those folks also did. I was able to identify a number of things and still doing so as we speak. I do agree with Bishop Cummings that this really is almost an inexhaustible topic, to be very honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something we can come back to once a month, for, yeah. to be very honest, and explore. We're, we're just too much work. Scratched, we just scratched the surface yeah. of the subject matter but some very important points being made by everybody in the conversation. Um, so for me, it was very enriching, very enriching. I do understand some of the struggles, challenges, issues of trust around some stuff. Um, as a pastor, if there's one thing I'm grateful for are the tools of research that my that seminary gave me with my master, when I did my master's degree study, um, et cetera, but seminary, Colgate did not give me my faith. Colgate did not give me all the information I've got. I got most of what I got from my people and from our research and from our study, et cetera. So um, that their answers, even for the last question that you raised that we didn't get a chance to respond to, their answers for that, all those translations out there, there's no question that they're confusing. I think too many of them, to be quite honest with you, in terms of biblical translations. But the beauty of something that a someone like I or Richards has or that Cummings has is in that those academic tools of being able to do word studies to understand what is that Hebrew word that looks different in one version over another? What is the Greek word Correct. that is different in that King James and that NIV or that NRSV? What is the real word behind that word that right. shows up differently in one version to the other? And we can give you the answer to that. Right. And, and, and a good explanation for it. Now it's up to the person that we're sharing the information with to decide whether that's acceptable to them or not. Because what cool. I found along the way, some folks want to hold on to what they want to hold on to. Yeah. You can give them what you can give them, but they, they can either, you let them decide what they want to do with the information and you just keep it moving. Correct. Thank you, uh, philosopher Ricardo Richard. My great people, love you all. Uh, we are still in the midst of a struggle. As you may have noticed some of my uh, premises bordered on the female. Uh, 
we are living under a patriarchal system that subordinates the female. And one of the reasons that I subscribe to Rastafari is because an emperor from an ancient tradition goes back to King Ori thousands of years ago, decided to break tradition and had himself crowned alongside a woman. Mm. Because our ancient tradition, as I referred the goddess Ma'at, where it was about balance. Being in balance meant we are aware and cognizant of what's good and what's evil. We are aware, but we kept a balance and we honored and subscribe to the female deity, the feminine aspect of nature, matter, mother earth, mother nature, mother. So since we are subscribing to a, pat a, a patrilineal, a patriarchal system, still in the Bible, when you use the word God, you are connoting a man. And one of the reasons that I refuse to use the concept known as God is for that same reason. I will say absolute cause, the divine presence, gotcha. are the universal spirit. So it, it, we must, you know, look and see how we can restore balance because that's what we are as Africans. Yeah. We need to restore balance. We are still subscribing to the patrilineal system. So mm -hmm. I end with that. My brothers and sisters, I love you all. Blessed Lord. Thank you, Thank you brother. Thank you very much, uh, the sincere Lord Richards. Uh, Veronica, if you have a few words of comment that you would like to make. Okay. Uh, I, I really want to, to say that this was a wonderful time that we spent together and we have learned a lot. We have have a awakening with a different aspects of the Bible and no doubt that I really believe that, that Jesus Christ is, was and is black. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have any, any problem with that. And, and the only thing that I need to say is that to all the people that are on Zoom and on Facebook, we were important, our forefathers were important, and we are still important. We are still contributing. So we need to be proud of who we are. We need to, to, to know that whatever we do will always live, um, live uh, or touch lives. We are going to leave footsteps for others to follow. And it, it more than just reading the Bible as, as um, Bishop Arlene said, we need to read and understand the message behind what we are reading. So we Thank live you. that and this is a wonderful work that you are doing. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. To bring awareness. I, um, we do have to, um, Try to do a few more programs. I don't know about monthly. It's a lot of work. It'll take me away from. It'll take me away from the other work I'm trying to do. But um, there are topics, other topics that are, are very important. That I feel females in the Bible is one. I remember watching a, a documentary probably about 15 years ago with six theologians from different uh, religious um, backgrounds 
And one of the things they talked about was the book of Enoch that was yes. not in the Bible. And they mentioned a lot of books related to females that never made it to the Bible. So even back then, it was tough for a woman to get a foot forward, <laughs> you know. But um, so it those still are is. Topics. I know it still is. I'm, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Even back then, you know. So um, and then we have a lot of um, queens that represented um, our African heritage, kings and queens. Uh, from back in those times. Um, I read where, uh, I think it was the Moors, that a lot of the European um, areas that they had conquered, when they got there, many of those European people, although they were kings and queens, they couldn't read or write. And they learned from those groups coming in and, and conquering their countries. You know, and eventually, I guess, the conquerors got conquered. But um, there is a lot to talk about related to the, the Bible and the Gospels and so forth. I am one that do believe because, um, you know, you hear so many different things from different people and every church has their own um, rules and regulations. And some of it you wonder about because some of the things that they that they might forbid or so forth. You, you, in your mind, you wonder how could that be a sin? You know, certain things that people might do and they consider it to be evil. You know, so there is a lot to learn and to talk about. I try to live based on doing good, doing what's right, you know, and try to be to be um, good and helpful to my to my brother, you know, or sister. So, um, but again, I thank. Bishop Orlean Cummings, uh, Licenciado Ricardo Richards, and Pastor uh, Honeywell, Ricardo, Richard Ricardo Honeywell, for your participation. Thank I you thank so much. Uh, my sister Estella once again for um, providing the platform for us to do this. Uh, Veronica, again, thank you. And you know you'll be the backup in all the programs that I do, you know. So um, thank you very much. We'll see which which program we put together. I did do a program with uh, Bishop Orlean and a few other people related to finance, and uh, I that missed that. It was very very popular. A lot of people liked it, and it's still being viewed on Facebook. So. Um, I would like to do something related to that. Again, I'll probably do that before I do the next one related to um, Africa and the Bible and so forth, you know, but there's a lot of history and there's a lot of other things aside from this historically that um, we could do related to these types of programs, you know, because there's a lot of our history as black people that's not being taught and that people don't know about. You know, simple things like, uh, you know, everybody talks about Thomas Edison being the inventor of the light bulb, but without a black man, that filament for the light bulb would have never existed. Mm. You know, so um, all exactly. those things need to get out and that information, and you know, we could use this as a, as a platform to interchange uh, that type of information. Um, Ricardo Richards, um, a program with yourself and other um, other members of the Rastafari uh, movement, I think would be a good program also because there's a lot of confusion about um, that movement and that um, maybe religion that people don't understand. And I do get asked a lot of questions and, and, and people sometimes feel that because you know you have dreads and you might be or might not be arrested that um you're involved in certain type of things so there's a lot of e <laughs> evil myths about yeah. um people related to that entity you know so maybe we could do a program related to that also um so that people could understand that it's it's, it's not what you hear in the news 
but there is a, there is a movement, there is a there is a, um, a belief, you know, and, and sort of like a, a it might not be the proper word, but a, a, a faithfulness, a fate towards what they do also, you know. So um, there's a lot that we could do, and um, hopefully God gives me the strength to continue and put um, other programs like these together maybe every couple of months. Not every month, Pastor Honeywell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nah. but, um, again, thank you very much, and I turn it back over to uh, Veronica. Well, as you heard, President Mr. Francisco, I already thank you, and I just want to reinforce that it was great being here with each and every one of the panelists. It was wonderful what you share, how the passion that you show when you spoke. Uh, so that means that we we still have a lot a lot more to learn about our history, and as we open with a religious invocation. Now we are going to close with the benediction. And for that, we are going to call Bishop Estella Knight to do so. Estella, give me one second. All right. Before, so you, um, before you pray, Estella, give me one second. Um, I do want to apologize to those that tried to get in early and they couldn't. You know, we had a little bit of technical difficulties, but that part was taken care of, thank God. Uh, we did have some problems with the, um, with the Facebook also. So um, the program, what we will do is um, once Estella get it all put together and, and pass it on to me, I will load it to Facebook so that some of those that missed it will be able to um, watch the program. Okay. So again, we apologize for that part of it. And uh, Fundacion Wake Up. Thank you all. Okay. I just want to say before I close out in prayer, I want to thank each and every one of the panelists that were here tonight. This was a, a very good discussion. You know, things that people really need to know. And like, uh, I'm not sure if it's Brother Honeywell said it, but yeah, this is something that is a forever discussion. So you need a lot of days and time. But we give God thanks for what was said and done. And we know that, you know, somebody was edified by what was said here tonight. And, you know, it's the lack of information that always, yeah. always, always turns things in, you know, different perspective. But we give God thanks for what you guys did today. Each and every one of you, Veronica, awesome as always, you know, with the moderator the moderator of the night. So I think now we just got to give God the thanks, the praise and the glory for what he has done. And Amen. we'll see eventually what the show will do because as it runs, you know, more people see it. And then when Francisco will make the decision if it's six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks and praise tonight for your goodness and for your mercy towards us. We thank you, Lord God, because without you, this would not happen. So we want to give you praise and, and glory. We want to say that you are worthy of the worship. You are our Jehovah Shalom, our Jehovah Rapha, our Jehovah Sitanu. And we adore you for what you have done here tonight. Because we know, God, Father, that as long as we place it in thy hand, you are able to make it possible. So we give you thanks, we give you praise. Bless each one of the panelists. Bless my brother Francisco Nice and continue to illuminate his mind that he will continue to go on with these programs that give us information, especially us that don't pay attention to certain things. These are the programs that give us the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So we thank you, Lord. Continue to provide the panelists and make them have the time available for whenever he calls upon them that they will come forward to help the Christian and the unbelievers to know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Everybody have a safe night.
All you right, as well. Good to meet you. Let me close off. Um, Facebook. Facebook. I will call you with the data, Stella. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be a few months, definitely. I got a lot of work to do. One second. One second. Uh, Brother Richards, are you in are you in Panama or are you up here in the US? I'm in Panama. Can you hear me? Well, come back to me again with that because I just had a phone call coming through and I had to let it go. No, I live in Panama. All right. How, how do I get a copy of your book, man? I would love to read it. Well, uh, to some degree. Remember I that goes not, a little. I am not on Amazon, but uh, I got a copy here, maybe. You know, this is, can you see it? Yeah. 